sir at 6 o'clock can we start sir mr jaisima can we start no oh, please i'm in your hands thank you a very good evening a warm welcome to all of you to the webinar series hosted by advocates association bengaluru one more evening and we have with us exuberant advocate mr shreyas jaisima so we are uh, delighted to have you with us today this evening a uh, warm welcome to you on behalf of advocates association bengaluru uh, be before we move on with our session uh, though you have asked me to a limit and just say advocate i uh, i am sorry sir i will have to briefly introduce you to our viewers of course they all know you but uh, still as a, uh, a routine protocol we will have to follow it uh, very briefly i have uh, kept it very short mr jayasimha is an alumni of uh, prestigious national law school of india university and was a chairing scholar at the university of warwick uh, he has over 20 years of practice in litigation he is also trained mediator and has been appointed as an arbitrator in india and internationally since 2016 he is a co counsel for the republic of india in two important ongoing investment treaty arbitrations Uh, Shreyas recently established Arna ADR in Maxwell Chamber suits at Singapore. Mr. Jayasimha regularly provides advisory and opinions to corporations on various issues relating to security laws and regulations, and represents his clients before various tribunals, high courts, and Supreme Court of India. He loves uh, to spend time with family and enjoys nature, and plays mridangam whenever time, his uh, time permits. all right once again uh, i welcome you to this uh, webinar series over to you sir uh, namaskara ellarigu um, and uh, thank you very much uh, to the advocates association in uh, bengaluru uh, to provide me this uh, humble opportunity to share some thoughts on enforcement of arbitral awards mr trivikram please um, accept my thanks on behalf of the uh, all the organizers and also to mr rangnath um please confirm that i am audible uh, unless i hear otherwise i will assume that i am uh, audible you are audible sir thank you the uh, topic that has been assigned um covers both uh, in a very very short period of time a vast area of uh, legal domains from enforcement of domestic awards to uh, international awards and i wanted to share a few thoughts on asset tracing and asset recovery so let me start from the last few words that i have said internationally uh before even a dispute is commenced parties often first size up the opponent to understand who they are up against and to understand where their significant assets are located this then allows them to plan backwards as it were from the date of enforcement of a decree or an award understanding where it would be what the costs involved would be what are the steps for enforcement before they commit significant resources time energy money uh, to initiating um, a dispute now there is a lot of jurisprudence that has also evolved around asset tracing and asset recovery and unsurprisingly it has the fingerprints of lord denning there is a decision um uh, called norwich pharmacol of justice denning which recognized the rights of a party who has suffered some form of economic wrong to seek ex parte relief against parties to provide information this has been extended in a series of cases including bankers trust and others where remedies have been instituted against bankers asking them to provide details of their account holders without necessarily even providing notice to the uh, account holder so ex parte relief has been contemplated and provided and this is not unique to only common law countries even in civil law countries you have several remedies for both civil and commercial um civil and uh, sorry criminal actions that are possible especially in instances of um, 
a fraudulent activity. Why do I begin with this? Well, we know the, how difficult it is uh, to obtain be it a decree or an award. And Kannadalli Kade Rontadu, of course, get down Sota, Sota, and Setta. Adre, that should not turn into being Sota, and Gedda. That is, the winner is said to lose. The loser is supposed to have nearly died. But what I'm saying is that that aphorism should not change even to a further, a worse situation where the loser actually is the winner in terms of time, in terms of the extent of, uh, that it takes to enforce a, a final decree or an award. And now, if you look at much of the literature that has come around enforcement of awards, much of it is technical in nature, dealing with the various uh, provisions of the Arbitration Act. When it comes to domestic awards, the first section that we deal with is Section 36. And it's important to keep in mind those words that Chapter 8 of the Arbitration Act begins with. I'm sure friends will have access to the Act as I speak. The finality of arbitral awards is captured in Section 35. This cannot be a, like a directive, uh, principles of state policy and, and a fond hope. It must be an achieved, perceived reality. And it begins by saying that subject to this part, an arbitral award should be final and binding on the parties and persons claiming under it. Now, at least in my limited experience, and I, we have uh, uh, many more experienced practitioners here. I recognize Mr. S. M. Gupta, uh, several others uh, with uh, tremendous seniority who have uh, joined. Uh, and they will bear witness to the fact that arbitral awards rarely go unchallenged. Even the thoroughly reasoned award is often subject to further scrutiny under uh, Section 34 when it comes to domestic awards and certainly is resisted when there is an enforcement action under Section 36. And if it's a foreign award, then the tests under Section 48 are, um, are scrutinized quite closely. Now, the uh, sea change that have been, has been the fond hope of uh, several parliamentary amendments has been to improve India's rankings in the enforcement of contractual obligations. Now, I often tell myself and friends that we do not need the World Bank to tell us to honor our word. We live in a culture where our, uh, we do not even require the written word to guide our way of life be it the concept of Smriti and, uh, while, and, and, Shruti, and especially Shruti being always available and in fact even being given an elevated status and saying that even the spoken word is a bond without it having been uh, reduced into writing. Uh, it is uh, quite a slide to see uh, the requirements uh, more technically that we have seen in the Evidence Act where the written word is now to trump the oral uh, commitments that have been made. All right, that was uh, perhaps uh, an incident of history. But even today, and even as of last month, for example, I have had cases in, from other parts of the world, such as in the Middle East, where, again, very complex and large contracts are entered into merely by oral statements. And as we know, for a contract, you just need an offer and expect, uh, acceptance. You do not require it to be written in writing. When it comes to an arbitration clause, if I can start from the very beginning, of course, it does require, because of the New York Convention and because of the Indian Arbitration Act, a requirement that the agreement to arbitrate should be in writing. So even if there is an oral contract, there may be a related written arbitral clause, which would render that oral contract also potentially enforceable through an arbitration procedure. But the, uh, the concept of arbitration, though it has been with us for decades and even, uh, I would say, uh, centuries, uh, the, uh, the level of suspicion around what happens behind closed doors is sometimes so high that there is um, 
uh, with a broad brush uh, of suspicion, even fairly legitimate uh, procedures are viewed with a slanted eye. In, in so far as international arbitrations are concerned, the parliament was of course even more cautious in trying to make sure that foreign, uh, that is international commercial arbitrations are given regard to and enforced on um, uh, much more expeditiously. And to, to that event, there have been significant amendments, especially in um, 2015 onwards, and also in uh, 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 subsequently in, in 19, where we now see an elevation of the scrutiny. Earlier matters, be it international arbitrations or domestic arbitrations, would all go to the court under section 21E which was the court having uh, jurisdiction over these matters. Uh, but now there is a separate separation uh, provided in, in so far as uh, matters pertaining to international commercial arbitrations being looked at by the High Court. And so we have seen, for example, the, the creation of a new um, roster in the High Court when it comes to AP cases, that is cases in Karnataka dealing with uh, Section 9s and other matters. Similarly, there have been amendments um, which have narrowed the scrutiny of uh, international uh, awards so that the, uh, the rogue horse of public policy that finds appearance in both section 34 of the act, uh, as well as in uh, uh, 48, uh, would then be uh, looked at uh, narrowly. And those are uh, several recent decisions that I will come to uh, in a minute. But now we have seen that insofar as uh, the uh, domestic awards are concerned, the culture of challenge as a routine step to every award uh, is fairly rampant. And I would uh, encourage friends to learn perhaps from the, um, I would say it's a bit with humility that there's a lot to be learned from the uh, culture of mediation, uh, not merely as a step towards fueling further disputes, either trying it as a lip service, either before a dispute, um, but rather to keep that channel of communication open throughout the dispute. So be it the initiation, in this case of an arbitration, or the, or the, or the conclusion of the process, and even after uh, an award is obtained, there is still scope to, to, to arrive at an arrangement with the counterparty that, uh, that allows you to have a effective commercial end to the dispute. Now, unfortunately, the uh, court records are replete with uh, cases that have dealt with the, uh, as Dwarapalaka cases, if I can call it that, the cases that are the gatekeepers to see whether parties will remain in court for another 10 or 20 years or whether uh, they might be given some reprieve. In the case of international um, arbitral awards, the, uh, you've had, for example, the recent decision of NAFED of the Supreme Court insofar as it relates to uh, Section 48. And the first thing in international awards is to first assess whether the country where the award is seated, that is, let us say very popularly now it is Singapore is a popular seat, London has been a popular seat, sometimes uh, uh, we have even seen awards uh, come out of the US. Now, the significant difference between all these countries I have just narrated is that while uh, some of those are notified as reciprocating territories under the Arbitration Act, others are not. And the consequence of not not identifying a country as a reciprocating territory under uh, the uh, Arbitration Act is that the awards would not find protection under that chapter to which New York Convention uh, awards are to apply. So although if you look at the UN website, you will find 160 odd countries as signatories to the convention. India has chosen to notify less than 50 countries. So at the first test, when an advocate encounters an international award and to test whether it can be enforced in India, is to ask whether it has been passed in a country that is where the seat has been a country which is notified under the Arbitration Conciliation Act. Next, you will have 
procedural requirements under section 47 of the arbitration act about the type of evidence that is required to demonstrate that there is in fact a, a foreign award and the provision speaks for itself whether it's the original award or authenticated copy etc even in, at this stage there have been decisions around whether the foreign award or the award has to be stamped adequately and why do I begin with this international? Because if you friends look around you in your own rooms at home or wherever your screens that you're watching this uh, presentation from, and if you were to count the number of countries which are represented by items that have been uh, allowed you to experience this moment, you will find that to be more than 100 countries or so. Look around you, your very device itself, and you ask yourself, where have all the components come in to be put together to create the device on which you're watching this presentation. That itself covers so, several countries. So today in 2020, we're living at a time when uh, our very being is, uh, and experience the world outside, uh, necessarily uses supply chains that have crossed borders. And therefore, my appeal uh, to all advocates, especially of our association, is continue to be Vishwa Manavas in our thinking and not be restricted to uh, the legal regimes where we were born and initially uh, introduced to law. Now, if you were to look at um, the other conditions of Section 48, you will see that uh, at the outset, the expression used is enforcement of a foreign award may be refused. There is even uh, an observation of, a, of the court, the Supreme Court, which has said that Therefore, even if the tests under 48.1 are met, it is only a discretionary power of the court to refuse enforcement. So parliament has set a pretty high bar on when awards can be refused enforcement if it is an international award. When it is a foreign award under the act, one ground could be that the parties were under some incapacity or uh, they were uh, they could not um, uh, properly agree onto that arbitration agreement. As I said, we all already have a case where uh, the uh, enforcement has been denied when such a ground has been in fact made out. Insofar as the second limb is concerned, this concerns where parties weren't given proper notice of the arbitral procedures or they were not able to present their case. This also happens internationally uh, very often. Imagine a situation, uh, you know, some supplier of a component from uh, our state in Karnataka uh, contracting with a party outside of India and uh, in arbitrations are initiated uh, outside at a high cost. Uh, quite often parties may be un unable to meet the arbitration at all, even attend to it. Firstly, I would say that, that uh, uh, the perception of high cost on international arbitration is also perhaps incorrect. And now with the ease of technological uh, communication without uh, travel, much of the costs can be, uh, can be significantly maintained. But having said that, there are still several matters already where parties have just not appeared in, in matters that have gone on internationally. In one such instance, uh, the court has had to consider in central trade as early as in June this month itself, in the first week of June, the Honorable Supreme Court has laid down uh, the decision in Central Trades case where it considered a case where a party in India refused to attend proceedings, uh, 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 unable to attend proceedings elsewhere. But finally saying that that by itself doesn't mean that the award cannot be enforced. So the court has even permitted enforcement even uh, by, by noticing that the arbitrator had then at least uh, followed the procedures that they had to, to follow. So all of these uh, might sound shocking to some lawyers uh, who will see that uh, even when there is a, such a basic thing as a non-appearance, but if there is other requirements are met and if the underlying uh, documents have been looked at closely, you might still end up with an enforceable award at the end of the process. Number three, uh, you've had uh, the most significant decision in recent times in the Vijay Kadia case, um, where in fact, the court not only allowed the, the enforcement of a, a foreign award, but also came down with such heavy costs as 50 lakhs against the party that was trying to resist the enforcement. 
So now a new element has been brought in to commercial litigation in India with both the Commercial Courts Act amendments as well as the Arbitration and Conciliation Act amendment, which try to introduce the reality of costs of litigation and arbitration and to keep them uh, as at a realistic level. Now, this economics of, of disputing in India is often ignored and it has resulted in some of the Indian uh, lawyers being uh, envied internationally as being amongst the world's, world's most expensive legal talent. And, uh, and this has a, uh, is this expensive legal talent when applied to cases uh, and when parties win or lose, or quite often the uh, judicial and arbitral decisions don't fully take into account the cost that it has taken to truly produce that result. But this is slowly changing with such high costs being adopted. And so for those of us who practice in the trial courts, um, who often, uh, who we, we've all seen uh, proceedings under uh, section nine or even anti-arbitration injunctions, et cetera, there's been a culture of this happening uh, for many years. But now we must be even more cautious uh, when we're dealing with contracts that have an underlying uh, international uh, arbitration clause that has been contemplated. Uh, finally, there may be other uh, instances where the clause is simply unworkable, but even in such cases, we have seen some courts um, tweak the clause or amend the clause uh, to, to, to recognize that this is what the party must have meant. And so there has been a significant pro-arbitration slant insofar as international disputes are concerned. The um, last thing before moving back to domestic awards, are the cases under section 48, uh, sub clause 2. Unlike sub clause 1, which requires a party to raise these questions, in sub clause 2, the court may itself, either on the application of parties or so moto, identify the subject matter of the dispute is not capable of settlement under the arbitration law of India, or as is famously hinted at, that it is contrary to public policy. But here, what is the public policy test has been uh, certainly the, the, the most significant case on this was the Renu Sagar decision, uh, limiting, limiting it to the fundamental policy of India uh, and uh, a couple of other very narrow tests. Whereas uh, the test was indeed followed in the Lal Mahal case also of the Supreme Court. But there is some doubt that has been introduced into uh, the full applicability of this test with the decision in uh, NAFED and Alimenta. While the court uh, has referred to each of these cases that I have uh, narrated, uh, it appears to have uh, uh, adopted uh, in its unique facts um, um, a, a test which could be argued as being slightly wider. Of course, it could easily be equally argued uh, that uh, it's still underscores and underlines the Renu Sagar limited test, but it is uh, for future cases to guide us as to which of those two uh, arguments will prevail. With this, I turn back to section 36. The primary difference that these various enact the, uh, the amendments have made, one is on the stay of arbitral awards. Earlier in domestic awards, the standard procedure was to institute a challenge under section 34, which would then have automatically stayed enforcement under 36. No question of paying any money uh, under the award and parties who have suffered defeat would enjoy the benefits of cash flow by not paying anything to anybody. This attitude of benefiting from breach or disobedience of, a, uh, uh, of an arbitral award has changed. Now, not only has it been clarified that the, there is no automatic stay once the section 34 is uh, filed, but the right to file under 36, of course, happens when the time for allotment under 30, uh, challenge under 34 is elapsed, that is about three months, or when that, uh, the, the uh, 34 itself, uh, the, when there is uh, no stay. Now, the courts have, uh, have been now, um, uh, empowered 
to to determine whether a stay should be granted on payment of money or the provision of a equivalent security the principles of the cpc have been referred to broadly without saying which of them precisely first place the permit to cut obviously for any form of enforcement is order 21 if it is then to be a to be decided as if it were a decree 21 may would be applicable uh, with full force and here again uh, we see that um, even with uh, the existing uh, applications being made let us say uh, with um, decrees itself uh, under uh, 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 38 onwards of the cpc uh, whether it is by the court that has passed the decree or whether it is a court which is to which the decree has been transferred to we do not see the kind of expedition that we would like even when it comes to decrees in the case of awards as i said much of it has got embroiled in these delays caused by challenges to the award under 34 now the act is quite clear that there, there is no automatic stay and the analogous provisions for example under order 41 would also be applicable that is if i were to let us say challenge a decree a money decree that would be subject to certain deposits that the court might require me to make and i cannot challenge a decree without paying anything at all the first attraction as we know to commercially to arbitration is that the cost of initiation of an arbitration is much lower than the cost of filing a significant and similar action in court there is no front ending of a deposit such as a significant court fee deposit is made when i go to court in the case of arbitration i merely initiate send my notices to initiate the arbitration file your claim the incidence of a uh, payment on the award might happen on the at uh, the time in which the award has been signed and that too if it evolves uh, certain types of uh, property and then the question of uh, stamp duty on the award may arise but so therefore there is a very significant commercial attraction towards arbitration as opposed to uh, court litigation but once we go through the process until the amendments came in the further attraction was that challenge to the arbitral award would have still protected cash flow because you were not re required to make those deposits thankfully i would say now there is a stricter regime this is not to say that all arbitrations are great and good and perfect and without uh, blemish that is not the case obviously uh, and especially uh, uh, courts have come repeatedly come down very heavily on arbitrator misconduct in domestic proceedings uh, in in and, and there are cases where there have, uh, there have uh, uh, we have all seen uh, on 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 even bias on on breach of uh, other obligations of arbitrators in domestic processes but in cases where there is um, now uh, no application um, when there is no stay that has been granted by the court even in uh, 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 any of these uh, matters the parties would uh, be uh, would be um, put to a greater sense of discipline and even the arbitrators now under are under a greater scrutiny uh, because they know that it is not that their uh, award will be scrutinized uh, only at the time of final hearing it will be looked at very closely even at the initiation of the challenge or the enforcement proceedings and therefore even the arbitrators are now put on notice that their reasoning is going to be looked at fairly closely even when it comes to determining whether this is a fit case for a grant of stay of enforcement and therefore the amendments have now shown that uh, the issue of uh, enforcement is front ended to the debate on uh, domestic awards also rather than uh, leaving it open and courts have in several cases uh, not only required some security but have even required uh, even a full payment of the award now this again depending on which party you are representing in proceedings might seem very unfair it might seem very unfair to have not only lost a proceeding which you 
party might feel has been unjustly decided and further unfair that to institute a challenge one must make a, a very significant deposit of money as well uh, however uh, this i think is a is a passing phenomenon as parties recognize the full weight of their obligation um, not only to initiate arbitration but during arbitration and post this process i think this will only have a sobering impact on the entire ecosystem which will recognize the power of that written word in an award and it is being given perhaps in, in my humble view a uh, um, uh, due uh, although belated uh, respect uh, as if it were a, uh, a court decree in terms of quick word on in terms of limitation as well there is uh, for example uh, one set of cases especially when it comes to uh, the applicability uh, of uh, article 136 of the limitation act which talks in the, about uh, generally 12 years but in certain other cases where 137 only talks about 3 years as we know as a general rule and this is also determined on whether the um, description of the act in court is an application or otherwise and certainly in so far as it comes to uh, international awards although there has been a, a decision of a court to say that even 12 years is okay in so far as an international award is concerned those of us who are conservative in our advice i think have been constantly uh, reminding parties that it is far safer for a party to move quickly to enforce an award rather than wait that period and take a risk to see whether it falls under 136 or 137 and to move well within the the three year period itself uh, lest it be argued uh, that uh, uh, the uh, the action is uh, simply out of time there are also um, cases around where the enforcement action can happen now i mentioned at the outset of my talk the uh, need to trace assets and know where to file there's no point in initiating action in a place where none of the assets are uh, significantly located you will be losing time also if there is um, uh, if it's if it's merely a, a monetary a liquid asset even tracing uh, how quickly that asset moves is going to be a huge challenge therefore identifying uh which place the award is to be moved uh, the enforcement application is to be moved is an important strategic goal in the sundaram finance case of uh, 2018 the supreme court has held that enforcement can be sought anywhere in the country and there is no requirement for obtaining a transfer of decree from the court which would have otherwise had jurisdiction over the proceeding and so the courts have also recognized this commercial reality of moving quickly to find the right place to enforce the action in the case of whether it is restricted to courts or what about other tribunals there as well the supreme court has weighed in in cheren properties case of 2018 where it permitted parties to enforce an arbitral award before the nclt because the award contemplated a transmission or rectification in the register of shares and saying that this is a remedy that the civil courts might not have had the opportunity to provide and therefore even before the nclt there can be potential actions uh, for uh, uh, for enforcement the um in short i will uh, coming to the end of my time uh, say this again that um, we are at a, a, a time when uh, we are all pretending that things are normal um and so when we are talking about these esoteric aspects without uh, a mention so far about the safety and health and well being of all would not be fully appropriate so uh, belatedly but sincerely i do wish each and every one of the listeners uh, uh, full health and safety uh, to you and your loved ones in this uh, trying time but in, in so far as the uh, changes that we will see we have seen the impact of uh, online engagement be it with courts or with arbitral uh, tribunals this is a trend that is likely to survive even after this pandemic ends second we have seen the the parliament also take certain actions 
I, or rather, I would not say, and, and, and the government also takes certain actions, such as, uh, for example, the suspension of the in insolvency bankruptcy court. Now, this is also pertinent uh, in some respects to the enforcement of arbitral awards. When earlier parties would have contemplated perhaps initiating uh, insolvency action pursuant to an award. Now you have seen the suspension of a few sections uh, of the IBC for a period of time and it may be extended uh, further. But once that period, period is, is lifted or that suspension is lifted, you will see that the IBC has of course given us very powerful instruments to enforce um, arbitral uh, decisions or even other uh, claims that are admitted as petitions under the IBC. And you will see increasing interactions between insolvency and arbitration. And recently I had occasion to give that talk to an audience in Chennai uh, or around the impact of insolvency on, um, on, on, on disputes. Finally, the um, trend of recognizing the narrow scope for challenge of international awards is again here to stay. There will always be uh, decisions that will be uh, aberrations to that general trend. But the general trend is very clear that international arbitral awards or foreign awards under the Arbitration Act have a strong presumption in favor of their enforcement. And so for each of our clients engaging in international commerce, we as council have to be doubly cautious of the type of advice that we render to them, knowing that now courts have also uh, uh, begun to impose very significant cost when um, aggressive litigation strategies have been put in place to counter enforcement of international or foreign awards. Insofar as the domestic uh, awards uh, are concerned, of course, you now have uh, a greater um, sense of uh, uh, foresight with uh, the 12 month period plus the six month extension uh, we've seen greater rigor come into the uh, domestic arbitration regime. I, the longest arbitration I personally have been involved in uh, lasted 11 years uh, from start to finish. Uh, now, hopefully uh, we will not hear stories like this um, uh, uh, now onwards. Uh, but it is, this uh, has made a massive change to the culture of, uh, of arbitration here, even domestically. And not only is it about timelines, but also on content. Given that the uh, arbitral awards would have to be given due regard, uh, and given that there is no necessary uh, you know, automatic stage, uh, we have to be cautious with uh, our uh, nature of our submissions and uh, how quickly we move. Um, uh, uh, and arbitrators, and we should see more people sitting as arbitrators, not only honorable uh, retired uh, judges of the Supreme Court, High Court, and the district courts but also senior counsel, uh, even people uh, from outside our legal fraternity. Uh, I hope we will be seeing them sit as, uh, as responsible arbitrators. And in the scrutiny of their awards, again, uh, enforcement actions will be uh, more prominent. Uh, and with that, I will uh, thank you uh, very much once more to the organizers for uh, permitting me to share a few thoughts. Uh, Danyosmi and Sarvam Shri Krishna. Thank you very much, sir. That was a very informative session. So now it's time for uh, question and answers. So uh, anybody who has any questions can place it before uh, the speaker. I repeat, anybody has any questions relating to the uh, topic of discussion today, you can place it before the uh, speaker. Parallelly, you can also send it offline um, where you have this Q and A box within the Zoom uh, application. All right. And um, Rangarajan here. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We are able to hear you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I have a question. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. So please go ahead, sir. You are audible. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I am not able to see the face of uh, Shreyas. 
uh, once you are uh, you're done with your uh, 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 once you are completed uh, once you are done with your question sir you will be able to see the speaker yeah. okay now under section this is pertaining to domestic arbitral awards now section yes, section 36 deals with the enforcement of the award as if it is a decree of the court when once we say it is a decree of the court section 47 of the cpc will come into operation all questions pertaining to execution discharge and satisfaction of the decree shall have to be dealt with only by the court executing the decree and not by a separate proceeding now my simple question is can a plea of nullity maybe in a very rare situation be taken like in our other normal civil court decrees so can a plea of nullity be urged number 1 number 2 what is the stage at which stamping of award is required to be done uh, thank you very much uh, sri rangarajan for your two questions the question of nullity is really um, it is not uh, uh, it is not posed as such in my respectful uh, view uh, to you and my humble view to you the uh, time at which parties can first challenge let us say the non arbitrability of the subject matter is one before the arbitral tribunal itself at the outset so one could could easily say that uh, this uh, tribunal has no jurisdiction uh, to to continue with the proceedings and under section 16 as you are well aware the tribunal has the competence to rule on its own competence so the ideas of the first uh, of of stating whether that the for example that the, uh, uh, the tribunal itself is uh, incorrectly constituted in some form or the other uh, uh, could all be uh, or or that the uh, it is exceeding the scope of its authority all of this is to be alleged as the section says as soon as the matter is alleged to be beyond the scope by way of Sir, by way, by way of defense. Sir, yeah, yes, yes. I go ahead, please. Yeah. Okay. So good. So I'm saying that at the first instance, in arbitrations, parties are expected to um, communicate their challenges at the very, very outset to the proceedings itself, and the tribunals are perfectly empowered to determine whether they have the um, power to uh, proceed with the matter. or if they wish to uh, terminate the proceedings at the outset itself if in your situation that the, the tribunal has uh, proceeded with the matter certainly these are matters that could be raised when it comes to the challenge of the award under section 34 the challenge of the award under 34 the the uh, the, the particular grounds that are mentioned there are certainly uh, to be looked at um uh in proceedings instituted for challenge now your question sees perhaps is a situation where a party has chosen not to challenge the award but only at the stage of enforcement parties uh, seek to uh, use perhaps uh, the grounds under uh, 34 as some form of a shield or or to uh, attack attack the award uh, at that stage Uh, at the stage of enforcement i will say at first that is a extremely risky legal strategy when a party has provided been provided a statutory right to challenge the award under section 34 and if a party chooses to waive that right it will be extremely difficult for parties to argue that there is a subsisting right to argue the same grounds and have as it were two bites of the cherry in separate enforcement proceedings under 36 so at the outset i would say that uh, you know while uh, you know parties of course would can will fam famously canvass every available point perhaps including the one that you have identified but i would say that it, it is at first blush uh, quite a high bar that they are setting themselves up against 
and it will not be easy for them to uh, merely try to argue, uh, fit in, as I said, an elephant into a needle's eye by saying, since there is now an opportunity to resist an award uh, enforcement under 36, then uh, we will uh, you know, uh, put in uh, every available uh, uh, challenge. Having said that, of course, on the, on the facts of the case, there may well be situations where uh, it is very difficult to proceed with enforcement given the circumstances under which the award has arisen, but uh, it'll, it will not be an easy argument to make, sir, in my view. Secondly, on the question of stamping, there it is quite straightforward, sir. The, uh, for example, there is a decision of the Karnataka High Court itself in uh, Sri Dili Babu's case of uh, 2015, saying that the relevant date for stamp duty be payable on an arbitral award would be the date on which it is signed. And so now when it is uh, signed, obviously, the, there is one stamp duty that is available. And quite often we have seen, uh, this is not always followed. The question quite often arises as to, let us say it is application for enforcement is, is filed at a subsequent date. Then the, uh, of whether the uh, stamp duty is to be then paid as on the date of enforcement. But I would say, I, I have given you this one case, and I'm sure there are other cases that you will be able to, um, to unearth as well on uh, a different aspect. But I would say at first blush, it is good practice to advise on stamping of the award as on the date of the instrument, such that you're protected against any further you know, increase in, in, in stamp duty at a, at a later point in time. I hope that answers both your questions. So we have got a question offline um, from an anonymous attendee. Question is, the award is passed in Delhi. Execution case is filed in Bangalore as a movable property is situated in Bangalore. Thereafter, if the award is to be challenged, is it in Delhi or in Bangalore? Right. So now, the um, uh, if the award is to be uh, challenged, when he says the award is passed in Delhi, it is still unclear to me as to what the uh, seat of arbitration is. For example, the arbitrator might have been uh, seated in Delhi. But uh, if the, the clause said that the arbitration is to take place in, let us say, Bombay or Bangalore or wherever it is, then you are talking about uh, the relevance of the, uh, the, the, the question of seat. So assuming that the uh, seat of the arbitration is also Delhi, as well as the uh, place at which it is physically signed, that does not necessarily mean that um, uh, that that the award the award will be um, uh, capable of being challenged in any other place. The section thirty four also refers to the use of the word court, and court again first refers to section two one e, which is the court who would have had jurisdiction over this clause, which in first blush would have meant the court in Delhi itself. However, when you are talking about an execution case being filed. This again, the right to file an execution case that is enforcement action, not execution, so it is enforcement under section 36, is available only after the time period under 34 is elapsed, or of course in the case where there is no stay. Now, if, the, uh, if that period has elapsed, then there is no question of instituting a challenge at all, whether it is in Delhi or in Bangalore, I hope I'm making myself clear. Because in the second part of your written question, you say, that an execution case is filed in Bangalore. That means that this three months period is over. Once the three month period is over, the right to institute a challenge, be it in Delhi or Bangalore, is not. Therefore, the challenge to the award is to be filed. In cases, and the challenge is to be filed. I want to ask. The proper court, which in the, this case would be uh, Delhi. Sir. Then we have one more question offline. Not popping up for the moment. Uh, if anybody uh, else has any question, has, uh, yeah, I see one question there on uh, trial court the judges sitting on appeal. I mean, uh, they are not sitting on appeal, sir. They are only testing, discharging their obligations, statutory obligations, to see whether it is uh, conforming to this act. And I think, in my respect, full and humble view, uh, we should not have an excessive sense of def def uh, deference to the identity of who the arbitrator was. Whatever their uh, 
Purva uh, Ashrama might have been, whether it is in the Honorable Supreme Court or Honorable High Court, they are sitting as arbitrators, nothing else. And they are discharging that duty, which is a statutory duty. And therefore, I don't think trial court judges should feel any diffidence or lack of confidence in discharging their statutory obligations when they are uh, viewing yeah. awards, irrespective of who the authors of the awards may be. That is my respect. Mr. Gupta has a question. Yes, sir. Mr. Shesh, thank you very much for your enlightening talk. Now, you, it, may, yes, it may be out of question, out of the subject, but a, a, a property situated in uh, Bangalore is a long lease date. Uh, the lessee is from Bombay. The lessor is in Bangalore. In a lease date, they want to enter the uh, arbitration class. Whether, what is your comment, sir? Because you use the word culture of mediation in your yes. opening statement. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gupta, for your very kind words. I'm, I'm humbled by them. I uh, first want to draw attention to uh, the very famous case of Booz Allen. Booz Allen's case uh, talked about whether immovable property and title disputes, let us say under a sale deed, can be arbitrated at, at all. Because when you're dealing with rights in REM, then the courts have uh, seen that arbitration may not be the appropriate mechanism because arbitration is only be dealing with rights in person, not rights in rem. And therefore, rights against uh, the world at large may not be capable of being determined fully by arbitration in a private procedure. When it comes to lease deeds, and since they are not necessarily uh, rights in rem, they may well be rights interstate between the two parties. And the Precise terms of the lease deed would have to be looked at to determine whether it first meets the test of whether it is an arbitrable dispute. Finally, there are live cases which are we are awaiting decisions of the courts. One such case is Vidya Jolia's case uh, on the arbitrability of uh, uh, of, of uh, various disputes, including immovable property issues, and that I believe has been referred to a three-judge bench of the Honorable Supreme Court. Uh, that there are also uh, some interesting uh, other decisions on arbitrability. This arises, sir, in the case of employment contracts, in the case of consumer contracts, also in the case of, let us say, trusts, and whether such disputes are also capable of being described as being commercial disputes. Because at the end of the day, you're talking about uh, the act itself is uh, the dis arbitration and conciliation of commercial disputes. And therefore, there is a wide a uh, sea of disputes, which will have to be seen as whether it is described as being commercial. Uh, so uh, at first blush, since it is as a lease deed, to summarize, uh, it, it may be possible to determine this dispute by arbitration. Uh, since you mentioned mediation, I think uh, Bangalore uh, Bar has a lot to be proud of, sir, uh, that in that we have a, a strong culture of mediation, culture of dialogue amongst ourselves, and there is no uh, sankocha or lack of shyness in, in, in picking up the phone and trying to resolve the dispute fully and finally on behalf of our clients. Uh, and there is no need of uh, grandstanding to demonstrate how great uh, an advocate one is by uh, dragging proceedings on in, in the cost of uh, parties. So uh, I think uh, that with that culture of mediation, sir, uh, is, is a welcome uh, breath of fresh air in this uh, commercial disputes, irrespective of the location of uh, parties or property. Thank you. Dear friends, any more questions? I would request you to place it before the speaker. Or you can also alternatively send it through the Q&A box. I repeat, if you have any questions, you can place it before the speaker. Or you can alternatively send it through the Q&A box. Since the questions have not yet come in, may I take the quick opportunity to say that um, I'm, I've been deeply privileged to uh, experience firsthand uh, how one can internationalize one's practice. Uh, and I, I rem remember people uh, smiling and laughing when uh, I was reading perhaps books in Mayor Hall or City Civil Court on, uh, let us say, international commercial arbitration, saying, uh, look, uh, being reminded in Canada that next case, Hirodo, uh, land dispute rules, and then you cross examination, what are you, you know, wasting your time for? 
in uh, reading about these matters. But I would encourage uh, advocate friends to please um, engage themselves with uh, reading uh, beyond just Indian case law. Uh, we are now at a time when uh, we need to learn from um, uh, jurisdictions beyond uh, uh, traditional sources of uh, merely looking towards England is, I would, I would put it, uh, uh, out of date. And we need to look at uh, uh, learnings from several other countries, irrespective of whether they're civil and common law. Uh, there is a lot of learning. Uh, at the end of the day, these are commercial disputes. And we really should not be wasting uh, this much uh, judicial time and energy uh, to resolve them. Uh, so, Anob Bhadra Yanto Vishwataha, and uh, I hope uh, we can uh, implement it uh, in our daily practice. Sure. Uh, in fact, as you have uh, enlightened us with this uh, aspect of uh, not confining ourselves to the um, you know, the territory of India. Uh, as we have time, you can just uh, speak about a little more uh, about the skill sets that is required for an arbitrator or a mediator. Some of the young um, advocates here, I think that would be definitely beneficial for all of us, in fact, not just for the viewers. In fact, personally, I would be also uh, benefiting. No, I think there is a, a tremendous strength in all of us that we do not recognize in that we are excellent with um, cultural communication. Look at perhaps the number of languages we all speak. Uh, it is definitely more than two or three, sometimes maybe eight, many more than that. And we're now living at a time when first is this ability to uh, comprehend and communicate across cultural barriers. I would say that is the first requirement to, um, to dealing with the world outside one's borders. And it is no different than dealing with, let us say, uh, uh, somebody from Delhi choosing to work in Bangalore. It is another cultural experience. That's all. It cannot be made much of. So it, it's okay if you're having to deal with a Chinese counterparty or if you're having to deal with a, a, a party from Brazil. It just takes a little bit of patience, a little bit of reading, uh, exposing yourself to their culture uh, to be able to communicate effectively and simply. Second, there are many, many books on arbitration, but there is one that stands out in my view in the title itself. It describes arbitration as dealing in virtue. Dealing in virtue. Because what you're banking on in the process of arbitration is that judicious sense of balance in that individual arbitrator. And you are then creating a community of personnel who are being tasked with discharging obligations that court would have otherwise discharged. And so uh, because of this openness of who those arbitrators are, uh, firstly, to all the friends listening, it is not an exclusive purview of the legal community. Although predominantly lawyers and judges have been arbitrators, uh, there are technical arbitrators we have seen in construction. There are uh, persons with very different qualifications, chartered accountants, many others who are able to perform this role extremely well. Third, and I am now speaking extempore, but there are many, many more resources that one will find online. There are many tools that are written down on best practices for arbitrators. Beginning at home, there has been a new uh, uh, a body in India called the Indian Arbitration Forum, IAF. And friends at IAF have come up with guidelines as to what are best practices to be followed for arbitrations in India. They have even come up with, uh, in the times of COVID, there are other uh, guidelines available internationally and here on um, how to deal with online disputes. They also can be referred to. Also, there are many international institutions and domestic institutions for arbitration. Within India, you have had uh, the Indian Council of Arbitration in New Delhi for a very long time. You now have High Court annexed arbitration centers in Delhi, Bangalore, several other places in Bombay. But you also have domestic uh, private institutions such as the Mumbai Center for International Arbitration. Also in Chennai, you have the Nani Palkhiwala Center. And each of these have also uh, sometimes notes and uh, um, on, on, on how arbitrations are to be conducted. Internationally, you have resources available to you. 
very easily at hand, uh, like the International Chamber of Commerce, which has a very interesting book called uh, Saving Time and Cost in Arbitration. And it looks at promoting efficiency in, um, in the disposal of commercial arbitrations. There are also notes to arbitrators from the London Court of International Arbitration called just that, it's called Notes to Arbitrators. And it's a very good reference point as to how one part, uh, a party can groom themselves. Uh, to end, I will say that uh, one must recognize that it is our business to keep our clients in the business of business and not to drag them into the business of litigation or arbitration. And therefore, it is a Sisyphean task. Sisyphus was a mythological figure who had been condemned to push back a boulder from a sloping hill. And therefore, every time he would push a little more, it will come back. And all his life was spent in pushing that boulder a little bit up and kept coming down. Similarly, uh, I feel that if we make our object that we should have no cases in our office, that we should have full disposal, not only of what is in court, but in what is in our offices, then we will begin to imbibe the attitudes that it will take to find creative and flexible solutions for the benefit of our clients whom we serve. Even if we adopt these attitudes, I can assure you friends that nobody will be left with an empty office. In fact, people who adopt such an attitude will be busier than ever, be they arbitrators or be they counsel. Thank you so much. We have one more question uh, offline. Uh, good evening, sir. If it's not much of a disgrace, could you please shortly touch upon the difference between seat, venue and place of arbitration as the judgments of the Honorable Supreme Court have laid down decisions on the said issues? The same remains a bit unclear. Okay. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I often have to argue this point in different languages in different courts. And um, let me begin with seat. I often use the example of either eyeglasses, and I do this, I take it on and off, or I take the example of a passport. Now, please forget that there is any dual nationality in the case of arbitrations, okay? So all arbitrations have to have some nationality, like a passport. So once you have an arbitration that is seated in a particular country, then it is said that the arbitration, I would say, travels with that passport. That is, if it is seated in India, it is an Indian award once the award is passed. So the seat of an arbitration will determine the nationality, as it were, of the award. Why is this relevant? As I explained earlier, there are several signatories to the New York Convention. It is the most popular and successful international commercial convention, full stop, under the UN system. And from 1957, when it was signed uh, by several, uh, when it was uh, uh, first drafted in New York, India became a signatory in 1960. We had the Foreign Awards Recognition Act passed in India in 1961. And since then, the commitment of India to recognize these awards is very clear. Also, as I said, there are awards that are notified, countries that are notified under the Arbitration Conciliation Act. And so one should look at the passport of the international award to see whether it falls within that list of countries that India has notified to determine whether it can be enforced in India. Next, if you look at the language, let us say, keep aside the international piece for a minute. And the reason why I say glasses is because it, it determines quite often the view that one must take in determining what tests would apply to such an award. And that is why I use the example of glasses. Then coming to the other words that you have used, um, the act itself does not use the word seat. The act uses, uh, you know, it, it uses the word place. When it says the place of arbitration is India. So you will find a uh, reference um, to uh, the, for example, um, when we say in section two, subclause two 
of the Arbitration Act, this part shall apply where the place of arbitration is India. Now, there have been, uh, of course, amendments uh, subsequent to that to also determine that provided subject to the amend, uh, agreement of the contrary, the provisions of section 927 shall also apply to international commercial arbitrations, even when the place of arbitration is outside India and an arbitral award is made or to be made in such a place where it is enforceable. Now, this uh, determination of uh, uh, this use of the word place has um, quite often been seen as actual reference to seat, especially when it comes to the context of determining whether it is an award um, to be recognized under uh, the uh, provisions in relation to the enforcement of New York Arbitration Convention awards. Domestically, the question of place sometimes also takes uh, uh, some color of uh, importance. For example, where do you go to file your section nine or an application for some interim relief? Now, if you have a case where the part, the, uh, the, the, the assets against which you are seeking some protection are located uh, in one city, but the place of arbitration is a totally different city. <clears throat> Surely, um, you must have some access to the court where the assets are located so that you can have some effective relief in that place. But there is a lot of gamesmanship or a lot of strategic initiation of disputes to try to take advantage of the wording of the act. One example of doing that is to initiate actions under section nine. The second time in which parties might come to court is at the time of appointment of an arbitrator under section 11. Now here again, there are decisions on which court is the relevant court to file your CMP before, that is civil miscellaneous petition in Karnataka High Court or under section 11 for seeking the appointment of an arbitrator. Parties could be at different places. The place of arbitration may be designated. And that is also another time when the issue of place becomes relevant, even in domestic proceedings. Further, it becomes also relevant when you are talking about uh, the, uh, uh, I will talk about a little bit about section 20, which talks about where the place of arbitration could be. It says the parties are free to agree on the place of arbitration, failing any agreement, place of arbitration shall be determined by the arbitral tribunal having regard to the circumstances of the case. And then you have, so if you don't have not specified a place, the tribunal can decide what should be the place of arbitration. Then you have a situation where you might require court's assistance in taking evidence, let us say under section 27. Here again, you need to rush to a court. And again, you will have to have uh, be mindful about which court you can approach. Uh, that is depending on uh, the applicability of these uh, these principles. And it says the um, and then you have the uh, time at which you want to uh, challenge a proceeding under Section 34. That is, uh, uh, it is typically at uh, uh, the court which has uh, heard where the, where the place of arbitration has. Uh, has taken place. Uh, and then you have the stage of enforcement, which has been the rest of my presentation today under section 36. These are all broadly the times in which you go to court apart from section eight. I reason why I did not mention section eight is because it is used uh, to push a proceeding into arbitration uh, and equivalent is uh, section 45 under the uh, international arbitration awards uh, section. Now, one uh, section that has to be uh, looked at uh, closely is section 42. Section 42 determines jurisdiction. And this occurs in chapter uh, 10 of the act. And that is in part one. And section 42 says that notwithstanding anything contained elsewhere in this part, where in respect to an arbitration agreement, any application under this part has been made in the court, that court alone shall have jurisdiction over the arbitral proceedings and shall, 
and all subsequent applications arising out of that agreement and the arbitral proceedings shall be made in that court and no other court. And so this is why I say there's a lot of mischief sometimes that is played around saying even if the place of arbitration is A, I will now choose to initiate proceedings in B so as to take advantage of section 42 and then argue that every subsequent application in respect to the same arbitration should occur only in B and not A, despite the, uh, uh, the uh, place being designated as A or despite the arbitral tribunal having decided the place of arbitration as A. Now, these are all uh, tricks that uh, the uh, people who are uh, uh, who have weathered uh, litigation and arbitration for some years would have undoubtedly encountered. But I hope that uh, without referring to the various decisions of the courts, I did not uh, touch that at all because that is a subject on its own. But just by looking at the statutory provisions, I hope I have been able to help you uh, determine uh, where there is scope to either make or avoid mischief. And of course, I would encourage everybody to avoid mischief rather than to make it. Certainly, sir. It was very helpful. Uh, once again, I thank you for this uh, session, wonderful session. So before we log off, I just want to make a small announcement. Tomorrow again, we have uh, one more webinar. Speaker is Mr. A.S. Ponnana, uh, Senior Advocate, High Court of Karnataka. And the topic is uh, evils of political defection and schedule 10 of the Constitution of India. So this is the topic. So see you all tomorrow at 6 p.m. All right. So once again, I thank you, sir. It was a wonderful session. So with your permission, uh, can we log off? Thank you for the opportunity. Namaskara. Thank you.